This is such a special pleasure um, being the, the managing partner of Enable Ventures and looking out and seeing the rock star, absolute rock star talent we have here today, entrepreneurs from the disability market, um, advancing technologies and solutions, new innovations to close the disability wealth gap. I wanna do a lightning round here, uh, get inside of their minds about why they're doing this um, and what their company, each of them, set, has set out to do. Each of them are founders and CEOs. So let me start with you, Thibaut. Tell me about your company um, and the origin story behind it. Yeah, sure. Thanks for having us here and, uh, and for you to be here and to hear about disabilities and, and, and technology. So um, I'm founder and CEO of Ava. Uh, Ava is a company that helps people who are deaf and hard of hearing um, to have conversations uh, as accessible as you have them every day. Uh, when you have this privilege, which is called hearing. Um, I was born in a deaf family, and basically this is something where I've always acted as the interpreter growing up. Um, and at some point, you know, scaling what I was doing from beyond the scope of a family to uh, the number of deaf harboring people, which is about 450 million people in the world. That's like one out of 20. Um, it was like something where we needed technology. So we built a, an app that provides live captions, so based on artificial intelligence, but also human help, depending on the situation. If you have a complex conversation, um, you want to have human intimidation. But when you have a day-to-day -day conversation, a dinner, uh, something pretty, pretty simple, you can actually rely on automatic captions. And so we built the, the fastest and most accurate captioning tool today that um, hundreds and thousands of deaf powerful people are using every day. Thank you so much, Thibaut. And so there's my friend Byron Dye. Tell me, Byron, what you're doing and why. Absolutely. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Byron. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Divergent. Divergent is the first all-virtual platform uh, providing job and life skills training to the 70 million Americans and adults uh, who are in the autism and cognitive difference population. And so for us, we really envision Divergent as the uh, first uh, lifelong skills development platform uh, for the adult disability population. Uh, for me, it's really about building a company that uh, you know, selfishly supports my family. Uh, I have a brother, Brandon, he's a 23-year-old autistic self-advocate. Uh, he has a co-occurring intellectual disability, and our family is like those 70 million other families. You know, we want to see him uh, be able to achieve and really attain a meaningful life, uh, realize full potential, uh, be self-sufficient and independent. But the uh, real challenge is that you know, we're all up here today because the innovations in market historically have not kept up with the needs of this population. So looking forward to having a, a really deep conversation and uh, talk more about what Divergent and all these solutions do. To support Thank you, Byron. Um, Mayan Ziv is a, uh, a leader, a transformative founder. Mayan, tell me about your company and why you're doing it. Sure. Thanks, Gina. Uh, so hi, everyone. Nice to see you. Uh, my name is Mayan based in Toronto, Canada. I started a company called Access Now, mostly because I was tired of getting stuck in the street. <laughs> I would show up at businesses, I'd go on vacation, you know, I'd imagine booking a hotel to show up at a conference and then there are five steps to the entrance after you've spent hours and hours researching just to get a clue, is it going to be accessible or not? And really that's what led me to launch Access Now. Uh, in short, what we do is we have a mobile first platform that connects business owners with consumers. Consumers that have questions about how accessible spaces are and if they'll actually meet their needs. So in short, you know, whether you need a restaurant, a hotel, a store, an office, a healthcare facility, you shouldn't be stuck in the street. You should be able to know, does that space have a wheelchair accessible washroom? Does it have a braille menu? Is it a scent free space? Et cetera, et cetera. So we, we launched seven years ago, actually, as a grassroots initiative, and now we're really excited to say that we're in 10,000 cities and sharing information about accessibility, both with, for, and by the disability community. That's terrific. Charlotte Dales from Inclusively, why are you doing what you're doing over there? Um, so I'm Charlotte Dales. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Inclusively, and um, I started this company a few years ago. Um, I have a cousin that has Down syndrome, and I actually had a tech company um, when I was living over in London, and while we were selling that business, she became the first licensed facialist in the state of Florida with Down syndrome. 
So she gives facials at a local salon. And ultimately, after getting my first facial from her, I knew this would be my next company. Um, it was just incredibly clear to me that what she had been told her potential was her whole life was not really her full potential. And what I noticed most importantly when I went and got my first facial from her was that her working um, employer only had to make some really basic accommodations or adjustments to her working environment and obviously the incredible impact it had on her career. And so I wanted to figure out how can we use technology to make it really, 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 really easy for employers to accommodate candidates' unique requests at scale across the disability spectrum. So we cover everything from Down syndrome and autism to stress, anxiety, depression, um, chronic illnesses, physical disabilities, and everything essentially covered under the ADA. So that's what we do. Terrific. And Richard Hanbury from Sana Health, tell us about your story. Um, yeah, so 30 years ago, I was driving a Jeep down a road in the Yemen near the capital Sana'a. I had to drive uh, off a bridge to avoid a head-on collision next to a petrol truck. So I had a spinal cord injury, traumatic brain injury, aortic tear, and all that resulted in a nerve damage pain problem that was so severe, um, I had a five-year life expectancy. So I had to make a device to solve my own pain problem. Um, standard of care really hasn't changed at all in 30 years. There have been small, small improvements in some areas, but not really. Um, the way I solved it was an audio-visual neuromodulation. Um, so this is what the next general device looks like. So it uses pulse light and pulse sound to change patterns in the brain. Now, we're going after a target market, which is basically a quarter of all Americans. So 25% of Americans take a psychoactive drug on any given day, opioids, benzos, or sleep drugs. And uh, we're aiming to be a replacement for uh, those or part of the toolkit that replaces those. Terrific. You know, each of you are working in... Um, companies that address different parts of the disability community and have cross-cutting capabilities. You are reliant upon the community as your customers, your consumers, where your demand comes from. I'd be interested for you to tell the audience a little bit about your, the relationship between your market rate companies and the community, the disability community. Thibaut, what do you have to say about that? Um, I have to say that it started when I was born. You know, it's like <laughs> I don't see them as customers and clients. I see them as family. Uh, you know, I, I grew up in, in Paris, in France. That's where the accent is from. Uh, and basically, you know, the friends of my parents were deaf. And, uh, you know, I had friends that were hearing and deaf, but they were mostly in the same community. So it's fun because, you know, growing up and, and building a solution to, to address problems, I would see my, my, my father face, my, my sister too. Um, you know, we help in, uh, in, in companies, so like, you know, meetings to be accessible was super important. And so my father basically never got promoted manager because of that. So always kind of like being told like you cannot do it or, you know, a deaf person cannot like manage or sort of communicate the same way. Um, I ended up just being able to help my sister. Uh, she wanted to be a lawyer. There was zero lawyer in France that was deaf. And, uh, uh, you know, using our product and obviously working like three times harder than I do. Uh, she ended up becoming the first deaf lawyer in France. And, and for me, this is important because it's like everything comes from there. My co-founder is deaf himself. Um, he's a CTO, and we made it to the Forbes 20 and th under 30. There's never been any deaf person before on that list. And it's kind of like uh, shocking in the same time. You know, this is like our responsibility to like, you know, open up that, that space to people who don't always, you know, get their stories heard because communication is their disability. You know, it's, it's hard to communicate with a deaf person. So it's like, it's, it's worth the extra push on their stories to hear them more because, you know, it's harder for them to just, you know, go in a family or even a restaurant sort of dinner and, and share the point of view and, and for you to hear their stories. So we try to make them loud and clear. And that's kind of our objective. That's terrific. You know, Byron, I want to ask you a slightly different question. Please. Okay. So Divergent has been deployed in, in states in the United States in the workforce system. And it seems that you've been able to reach other populations, um, other DEI populations, That's with correct. your upskilling platform that originated to serve people with autism. Can you talk about how disability solutions begin solving for one problem but have often so much potential to reach other people in society? I, I think that's a a huge question for us because when we when we think about the curriculum and what 
we built with our platform. I think the initial, again, the initial uh, selfish desire was you know, built for my family. But the experience that we had was what we were seeing around getting access to high quality 21st century job training, getting access to social skilling, getting access to really the essentials of being successful in a workplace. Uh, these are not just disability specific uh, needs, but they are acutely and more strongly felt in that community. So what we were finding was that, you know, for us, we are the first company that has a reimbursement element around our job training. Uh, that's something we're really proud of. We're in Arizona, we're in Texas. Uh, we always say that we're the first workforce development company that has successfully adapted a healthcare model into the way in which our go-to-market operates. So in that mechanism, what we found is that you have states which actually support populations beyond uh, that neurodivergent population which we started. They're supporting veterans, they're supporting uh, folks with uh, severe mental illness, chronic conditions. They're also supporting folks across Native American populations. In Arizona, that was actually one of the biggest pilots that we ran, was across the Navajo and Hopi nations. And we're finding that there is that commonality and challenge uh, that in many ways was enabled because we were thinking universal design, we were thinking accessibility. So I, I feel that in many ways that was a, a way to really uh, lift all boats in a sense, that we were able to start with that population and actually find relevance across the board. That's terrific. And Mayan uh, talks very casually with me and she'll say, you know, when I, when I light up a city, when I turn on a city, and I say, what are you talking about? <laughs> and she uh, really lights up a city. Can you explain to folks what uh, that means? And beyond the metaphysical that is. <laughs> and also explain what the consumer market is that's, that is driving demand for your particular solution. Yeah, happy to. I mean, uh, maybe I'll start backwards and say, you know, we're talking about an extremely overlooked and underserved market. The disability market, as you spoke to earlier today, touches every person at some point in their life. And so often when I'm speaking with people and they say, oh, well, that's really nice, but that, that's a you problem. I say, <laughs> well, just wait a few years or if you sprain your ankle or you know, maybe your, your mother is now acquiring a disability as she's aging or the list goes on and on. And so the way we've looked at it is that accessibility is fundamentally a customer service issue that's been neglected for a very long time. And so what we do is we connect with business owners and we turn on cities in, in the fact that we look at geographic zones where there are clusters of businesses, lots of citizen engagement, lots of people who are you know, going places, doing things. And we, we look at you know, what are all the touch points that a, a citizen or a customer has in their life? Where do they need to go to shop? Where do they need to, you know, a place to stay if they're traveling? And, and how can we enable freedom of choice? And if you've noticed, I haven't talked about accommodation, I haven't talked about disability. I'm talking about consumer decisions driven by a pain point that has been ignored for too long. So what we do is we, we go city by city. And we started just with one. We started with Toronto because I needed to get around. And we've been able to grow by connecting people with disabilities, friends, families, uh, and, and now also parents with strollers, and the list goes on. People who have recognized that they've got some type of need that drives their decision making that has been neglected uh, by mainstream platforms and by general businesses. So they come to Access now looking for that information. And now we have kind of the, the unique asset where we can connect that data and that consumer engagement directly with the citizen, with the cities, sorry, that actually provide that value. So that's kind of the two-sided relationship we're building. That's terrific. And Charlotte Dales, you are working on a two-sided marketplace, a job matching platform, and you are driving inclusive hiring as a result. Can you talk a little bit about what it's like to compete in existing sectors and markets that are saturated? but to drive new value by your relationship to the disability community and people who are thinking of how their job search is run differently. Yeah, I mean, it's similar to what Mayan just said, which is that a huge part of their decision making with wanting to get a job. And frankly, anyone can identify with this. Like, there's the actual skills and the job and the company and the compensation and all these things that we already use to make our decision. But then there's 
you know, putting disability aside, like what's the maternity leave? What are the healthcare benefits? What's the flexibility? You know, these are all accommodations that, you know, are, are overlooked for everyone when they're looking for a job, but it's particularly um, more adversely affects people with disabilities um, who just have different access requirements, who may perform better in an interview setting that's slightly different than the one that the company's been rinsing and repeating over and over. Um, and so I think that, you know, for us, when I started this company, so many people said, you know, why isn't, why are you not a nonprofit? Um, and I thought, you know, well, because if I really want to make impact, I need businesses to see the actual value in hiring people with disabilities, not um, feeling like it is optically moving an initiative forward that they speak about, but um, that it actually provides value because if you can create a sustainable business model around impact, you can actually continue to grow it. And so I think when you're existing inside of a, you know, industry that's been s sort of baked for many, many years, there's lots and lots of um, pattern matching that happens. And that's really, I think, the biggest piece that it's really not that hard to accommodate people with disabilities. The majority of accommodations are free or under $500. But when you're existing in this ecosystem that's had the same type of almost superficially efficient hiring processes over time, you're really just trying to explain that this other way is not only um, easy to execute, it, un it untaps a huge demographic for you that's gonna be, um, has, provides a lot of benefits on its own, and by being able to be flexible, you're just creating a better hiring process for everyone. Richard, I wanna ask you something. How have your personal experiences informed your understanding about market intelligence in the sector you're trying to sell into? Um, well, these personal experiences go into sort of two buckets, because um, now I have the personal experience on the, the business side. Um, on the original side, it's kind of understanding the, that there's no actual real difference between mental health and central mediation of pain. I mean, literally in the brain, it's the same pathway that's dealing with anxiety as dealing with pain. And the number of things that are done catastrophically wrong the whole time, like, um, oh, you have pain, but um, that's gonna be making you depressed. Also, we'll give you some more drugs for the depression, even though you're only depressed right now because you're getting taking this chemical hit because you've been in pain. Um, so all of those kind of things that get missed, but it's even by really good pain doctors who know what they're doing, they still miss some very basic things on a very regular basis. So that's on the personal side, being able to tell people, yeah, I know what that's like because. Um, and then on the business side, I've been sort of, you know, experiencing a lot of um, the, the fundamental things that are wrong within the US health system. Um, you know, in the UK, the last person to be made medically bankrupt uh, was in 1956. Uh, here, it would have, three people would have been made medically bankrupt while we've been on stage. It's the largest cause of personal bankruptcy in the US larger than every other cause put together, even in spite of Obamacare. Um, and so kind of understanding from a personal perspective, like how, how do you get out and help more people and how do you find the people who need the largest help? Um, yeah, both the 30 year journey of trying to do the device um, and the personal stuff, they, they both help. You know, I'm curious, uh, and I'll just open this up to all of you, but how do you think the solutions that your companies are advancing will have impacts across society? You know, uh, I, I was reading in the Wall Street Journal the other day that 70% of Generation Z prefers captions. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. You know, uh, so talk a little bit, and we'll just go around, talk a little bit about how the, uh, the matters that you deal with every day are advancing innovation across civil society. Yeah, I mean, I I think about it a lot. I, I think we're in, um, in, the, in the technology of communication, right? And uh, there's already been fundamental revolutions in technology. And when you look at the history, uh, you know, internet, the SMS, uh, like things that you use every day, uh, what, what, what is little known is that the, you know, some of the inventors were deaf or hard of hearing, or they did it for deaf or hard of hearing people. Like Alexander Graham Bell, his wife was hard of hearing, so he invented the gramophone and he ended up being in the telephone. Uh, Vince Cerf, hard of hearing and co-founder of the internet with Ber Bernoulli. 
So, so the shortcut is really that, um, you know, the FR hardware people are at the forefront of those communication technologies because they have those needs and, you know, those needs sort of change. And so, you know, they were doing captions way before, you know, the teenagers use captions. But somehow, you know, like for big companies, it's important to find um, a business value in this, right? To be able to sort of like provide it for everyone. And we just keep repeating, you know, if you invest in accessibility, you actually create value for everybody. And, you know, what more than just proving this by just creating successful companies who improve the customer service. Um, you know, we work with uh, some of the largest retailers in, in, in the world. And uh, basically, you know, during COVID, everybody was telling them like, hey, like you have those clients now that just can't understand what your, your people in stores are saying. And so they basically changed their conception of what means to be doing customer service, right, in stores. So that's like, you know, starting from a technology that was used in a very personal sphere, you know, extending to the rest of society. And now, you know, you have like 250 stores across the U.S. who are, you know, with this structure that was led by deaf people and will end up to have like a more inclusive store for people from foreign languages, you know, and, and also like you know, hard of hearing people who just didn't dare to say that they didn't understand and they didn't even ask for, for advice. So I think changing this infrastructure using disability as kind of like source of invention has been done before and it's about recognizing those patterns and really investing and 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 sort of like pushing this and we don't do this everywhere it's a you, you he mm -hmm. hit a little nugget in there which is that the captioning technology that you have created could advance uh translation of language yeah. as well so serving other populations uh byron what's your answer on that i'm, I'm always sort of surprised uh, because for this answer our biggest insight really came from speaking with parents with children who are not in the disability community. You know, they, when we talked to them about the job readiness, we talked to them about the skills development. You know, they say, "Hey, I, I have a son, I have a daughter. Uh, you know, they're neurotypical. They, they aren't in this community, but they would benefit because transition to adulthood and independence and self-sufficiency is hard. You know, these are skills that are universal. And I think what they're sort of highlighting is that there is a there are these kind of common universal challenges you know, that are more powerfully, powerfully felt in some communities than others, but they are still universal problems. Mm -hmm. So when we think about what we're doing around the, really the support of, uh, you know, of you know, providing somebody, say, a great career that's you know, of, the, of the modern era, another way to think of it is that we are trying to support someone to become independent, which is really the hallmark that a lot of families look at as you know, I'm independent, I'm self-sufficient, I'm starting to realize my potential. So I think about the kind of the broadening of civil society is that we're getting these sort of early indicators from states like Texas, we're getting some indicators from you know, our academic studies, we're getting about 2,500 folks who are you know, in the disability community who have gone through our programs. And yet the, the request is, you know, when are you going to broaden this you know, from special education, from workforce development into a broader pool? And I think all the solutions on here are building towards that kind of a future and you know we'd be foolish not to pay attention and maya what do you think so as we're having this conversation i keep thinking about something that i know is true but a lot of businesses or organizations that i've engaged with have not yet figured out now you will all know this as well is that i very much look at the world is that i am not disabled it's the environment around me that's the disabling factor the fact that, <laughs> and, and you know, this applies actually to, to many organizations that work towards advancing inequities in, in various groups. But for the disability community, this concept about nothing about us without us is fundamentally the difference between companies like these that are building with and for the disability community versus companies who have not yet acknowledged that major gap. And so the way that we look at it at Access Now is that we are building trust inherently with a community that's been underserved and neglected for a very long time. And that that trust and that loyalty has value. And that's an asset that can power many other companies around the world. Companies that are consumer facing, digital websites, event planning, booking, you know, all reservations, like we touch city building and infrastructure because what we're, what we're narrowing in on is the insight for a mass demographic that has just not been part of mainstream 
discussions or ways of doing business. And so we, we don't look at it as an, as an add-on. We look at it as a fundamental way to changing how we do business with every company that's consumer facing. And Charlotte, how, how is inclusively driving change across civil society? Um, so similar to what Mayan has said, like we think about this as disability is the largest minority segment. It's making it the largest untapped talent pool as well because it has the highest unemployment rate. Um, but it's also the segment that intersects all other um, diversity demographics. So when you solve for disability, you're not just solving for disability, but you're broadening pathways for you know, first generation college grads, um, single parents, caregivers of people with disabilities. Um, and so our vision at Inclusively is to create one front door for everyone. There doesn't need to be a side entrance for people with disabilities and a platform over here for people of color. If you can actually solve the problems about why they're not getting in your front door in the first place, then solving for disability is, you know, got probably the most use cases you can find and it's going to touch every other demographic. And so we believe that by solving for that, you're solving for a lot of the other um, diversity and inclusion and ESG initiatives that, that companies and culturally we're trying to solve for now. Richard, how are you contributing across civil society through SANA Health? Um, I was just going to disagree with one thing that's, uh, that was said, that disability isn't a minority. Um, it is the majority. So 70% of people are taking a drug um, for um, a chronic illness. 40% um, of the population are taking it for two. 90% uh, of the population uh, surveyed by CNN and KFL two weeks ago said that we are in the middle of a mental health crisis. And they knew someone personally who was in the middle of a mental health crisis. Um, standard of care of the drugs. If you take um, all the psychologists and psychiatrists in the entire country and have them working in a fantasy world where there was no paperwork so they could do 95% efficiency, they could still only reach 6% of the population. So you've got drugs that don't work, you've got a lack of um, mental health professionals, and that number is falling. Digital health, the broad category, has to fill that gap. And we're a part of that solution. So we're basically, with this device, removing the need for a lot of those meds that have extremely long-term bad problems, including massive increases of risk of Alzheimer's and dementia. So really it is being part of the solution to remove drugs from the system um, where they don't work, where they cause long-term damage, and giving people back more control over their lives. I want to ask all of you to please share your vision for where your companies are going and where they will be in, in, a, in a few years from now. Yeah, thank you. It's, it's always an interesting exercise because, you know, in the beginning you have those big visions and but you have to be very focused on, on the next step, you know. And then as things progress and you grow and now we're like a team of 50 people, uh, you start actually being like, this is actually possible. Like, we, we could get there. So for us, um, what's important is like when we touch uh, therefore, hard of hearing communication, it's about captioning. And when we think about captioning, it's about conversations, right? We power conversations that are happening in schools, at church, at work, uh, in customer centers, in parks, all those kind of things that actually makes us human, right? Like we speak for, I think the average is like 10 billion hours uh, a day at the human level population. And I always like, I'm fascinated at this because I'm like, I remember those conversations I have with friends and we just like kind of like spend two, three hours in a backyard and just having this profound memory. Uh, our number one enemy is memory because two weeks later, you basically forgot what happened, you know, and you just remember it was a good time. But like all the things you've learned, sometimes that's really frustrating. So we're thinking about like a revolution around uh, deaf-led uh, communication to be different. Um, you know, what's interesting is like a deaf person will, will naturally need an intermediation. But when you use it just as a as a day-to-day -day, um, sort of hearing person, you actually find value. You can remember, you can have that perfect recall of conversation. You can find and share context when you need to as well. Um, and you were talking about sort of like the way it spills over. Like we we end up having parents of autistic children who just you know talk to us and say, "This is really important. Uh, we're having sort of like this this kid who needs it." So we see this kind of like spreading across society, but. 
what's fundamental is the question around human communication, right? It's like, how do we improve human communication at an era with technologies in our pocket? And, uh, you know, we see sleep, we see running, we see tons of uh, technologies out there improving all our skills, but we don't think about communication. Like, when's the last time somebody really gave you insightful feedback about your own communication? It's rare. You have to figure it out all by yourself. You spend sometimes 20 years, sometimes you don't even get it, to think about, like, how to communicate better. And this is really the matrix for the rest of human collaboration. So our Eva company logo is an ampersand. It's not like a caption bar or anything. It's an ampersand. It's about connecting a human with another and figuring out how to make this better. Byron, where are you going with your company? It's, uh, it's, it's tricky to, to tell a vision without maybe telling an uncomfortable fear. And this is really, I think, really a represent now talking to the autism and the cognitive difference population. Uh, and especially when it comes to the families that you know, both myself and maybe folks in the audience may, may feel. But right now, the fear that we hear from parents and we hear from families is what happens when I'm gone. And self-advocates you know, articulate this, or as well as those who are moderate or higher support. This, this is really baked into the identity of Divergent. It's a feeling that right now, this feeling is felt because the system itself is not supportive, because there isn't a pipeline, there isn't a level of readiness or support or training that can prepare somebody for that next phase of life towards adulthood. And so when we hear this, and when I hear this, I, I kind of think back to you know, my family as well. You know, we feel this because my, for my brother and me, my mother passed away nine years ago. And so we're sort of half, maybe darkly, we're halfway there uh, about what's going to happen to our family. So when we think about the vision, we think about what they call falling off the cliff. You know, this is what happens for many in the disability community where uh, if you turn 21, 22 in the States, you lose, you lose your services, you lose your, you lose your schooling, your counseling, your therapy. Uh, you enter into a very chaotic adult services ecosystem. And what we want to be is the safety net, that somebody can bounce back and actually be successful and thrive because of this type of, uh, really this type of modern support and skills development. So I, see, I think about that vision as being that safety net. You know, how can we catch and be able to get somebody back on track? Because that's, that's the aspiration of self-advocates, that's the aspiration of families, uh, and it's really universal as well. Mayan, where's your company going? World domination. No, uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> what you're going to light up the world, right? Not, not just cities. Okay. <laughs> I mean, so we started in isolation. We started on our own. We started with a group of volunteers who, you know, I would call up my friends and say, hey, wh when did you get your hair cut last? And did they move the chair? And could you drive up to the the mirror in your wheelchair. Like we started really, you know, with the tiny moments where we're just trying to figure out, you know, what does good customer experience look like when you have a disability? And I think where we're headed now is that we've seen an amazing shift in the last year, I'll say, uh, where businesses are starting to realize that there is a huge market opportunity. And for us, that's tremendously exciting because as opposed to working in isolation, yes, we work with businesses directly, but now we can also power through our data and our insights every other platform on the internet that is consumer facing. So the next time that you look to book a hotel or make a decision that requires you as a consumer to purchase something, or to move through a city, or to decide where to live, you are also met with data and direct insights that are reflecting authentic lived experience. So for us, that's really the next frontier, is being able to power all the other solutions, and hopefully many more to come, with authentic, honest um, data that captures both real human lived experience from a variety of different needs, uh, and, and we do that by uh, using actually machine learning, but I'm not going to talk about that today. That's the next panel. <laughs> <laughs> that's your secret sauce. Yeah. Or that's your next panel. Okay. Uh, Charlotte, what, where are you going? Um, so I kind of said my vision earlier, but we want to create one front door for everyone. What that kind of looks like in practice is that 
any hiring manager, anyone interviewing a candidate, if they receive a resume and an accommodation request alongside that, they know what to do. They're not sending it off to legal and compliance, which is traditionally what's happening right now. Um, and I think that's when you kind of know that people are actually making this part of their daily practice and not some tangential diversity initiative. And someone asked me recently, how will I know if I've succeeded? And I have two kids, one on the way, and I think that um, I think that if you know, in 20 years when they're entering the workforce, if their boss or their boss's boss was an inclusively candidate or has a disability, that's like going to be the sign that not only did we help get people into jobs, but it, they want to be promoted and be leaders and managers just like everyone else. And you know having leaders of large organizations being represented by people with disabilities will mean that not only did they um, care about hiring people, but they cared about changing the culture so that they're successful as well. Richard, where are you going in the future with SANA Health? So we should have five FDA indications in the next 18 months, fibromyalgia, neuropathic pain, anxiety, depression, PTSD, uh, becoming standard of care for those five instead of the currently available drugs is the, is the real aim. Within fibromyalgia, Lyrica is the best-selling drug. Um, it's so bad on its side effects that 90% of people aren't taking it by two years. Um, we are providing a much better alternative. So it's basically helping the worst of the worst get off the drugs that aren't working and then working backwards to become standard of care so that when someone goes to a primary care doctor in five years' time with anxiety, um, impacting mental health or pain, then the doctor says, okay, use this device and then come back and I'll see what symptoms are next worth treating on your list of treatments. So that's the aim. Terrific. Okay, give this uh, panel a hand of your hand, <laughs> some applause. We're, we're going to take a couple of questions. We are running out of time, but we'll try to do a, a if the spirit moves you kind of panel. So <laughs> if you're moved to answer these questions, you guys, uh, looks like first one from the audience. Well, somebody says, Thibaut, that we should have captions next time at SOCAP. Yeah. <laughs> How we, about it? We discussed about it. Uh, Mike Fonda was supposed to come, but he's uh, in Taiwan right now. And, you know, it's like if any deaf person had said, like, hey, I'm interested for accommodations, we would have done it. But I think, you know, just logistically, we are, we're going to do it next year. We commit to it. Okay. <laughs> Let's do that. Let's do that. That'll be great. It'll help everyone. Um, so how does disability interact with DEI? It's a big question from the audience. Um, you know, what I've observed is I think that disability is often erroneously left out of DEI conversations in finance. Maybe. So uh, how do we change that? Uh, do you all identify with driving change through the, the, the middle of DEI by doing what you're doing? I could start. Uh, I find that this is a very odd part of my job is that I sit in conversations and where I'm led to speak with DEI experts and they're often completely just with question marks about how disability fits in. Yeah. And I think that in itself is a major issue. I mean, disability reflects the diversity of all human experience. And until we get to the point where disability is acknowledged, in those conversations, I think we're very far from reaching a day where these types of conversations are the norm. So I think, you know, it's, it's up to the people at this conference in many ways, if you're working in that space, to ask yourself, am I engaging the disability population? And if not, how can I? Uh, and who on your team has a disability right now? And if not, work with inclusively. <laughs> The, the other question, and real quick, we got, we got this, guys. Uh, how's the ADH generation going to change everything with this marketplace? The, the what? The ADH right. generation, people who've come, well, come of age with rights, access, and right. consumer preferences. The idea was like 25 years ago. So this still is like inspiring other legislations all around the world. And it's interesting to see that I think Europe just passed the legislation. Canada sort of passed it as well. Um, I think, you know, not enough is the first thing, right? Like the DEI initiatives just not always taking into account accessibility. 
it's, uh, it's something where I don't think the ADA generation is the one. I think maybe the millennial generation, the climate change uh, aware generation, that starts just to include those problems and, and, and live them. It could be mental health, it could be all those, those kind of things. It's about awareness. So the generation that will create more awareness will be able to, to tackle this. This has been terrific. Thank you guys for joining me on stage and thank the audience for being here for it. This has been fabulous. Thank you.